Hello, students. Welcome back to the Matthew Schoen Sociology Experience. Uh, this week, we have been talking about education, and that is still um, my task for today, is to continue this uh, discussion of the education institution, move beyond this discussion of school quality and how schools really matter to a discussion of what education as a sociocultural asset means for you. Okay, um, which is a which is a different experience, which is a different type of discussion uh, to be having. To be clear, so today I am going to approach this discussion of how education matters um, through the uh, the starting point of human capital theory, um, and then uh, work that into a discussion of higher education. Um, and at the end uh, of this video, I plan to do some back of the napkin math, uh, where we're actually going to price out what does a college degree cost and what does it get you. Back Back, and so we will all determine whether or not you've made a terrible decision with your life by going to college, but you will have to wait until the end um, to see that. Now, in the way of announcements, uh, I generally was pretty pleased with um, the re first set of reaction papers that I received um, from students who were learning entirely remotely last week. Um, now's my chance to evaluate everybody. Um, so I will be having virtual office hours on Thursday as regularly scheduled. And I certainly welcome your email discussions and your email questions uh, to me if you have any uh, questions or concerns at all about how to do really well on this second assignment. As we stand right now, um, people's grades can easily go up if that is what you are uh, hoping to do and can easily be solidified if that's what you are hoping to do um, because now we're going to do a 60 point assignment it is due on friday and it is very much in your best interest to do a really good job on that so do not hesitate to reach out to me if you feel i can be helpful to you okay so my agenda for today i will start with a discussion of human capital theory then I will talk about a really interesting concept called credentialism, uh, which, which is a way for trying to hypothesize about how education affects your life course. Um, and then we'll finish up with the discussion of college. Ready to go? All right, let's do it. So human capital theory, this is an old economic, uh, really, I guess I would say social economic theory about the effective investments in human beings. So the starting point here is the discussion of capital. If you took macroeconomics or if you took really any history class uh, in high school, um, the definition of capital is likely something that was explained to you. Hu uh, capital, just in a pure economic sense, is the things that allow value to be generated. So raw materials, for example. Factories, like not what happens in the factory, but the factory itself. It's a place that allows production to be facilitated. Um, that's all capital. What about investments in people? Because the assumption of the theory is that, well, if investments in the physical capital, let's say you pay to upgrade the conditions of a factory that might allow that factory owner to produce more widgets or whatever was coming out of that factory in the first place. In the same way, an investment in your own productivity should also allow for higher productivity, for greater economic gains. It should make you a more valuable asset within a capitalist economy. So this was originally pr proposed by um, um, by uh, Becker, Har uh, Harry Becker, um, in 1964, um, and it's really crept into a lot of the economic discussion about what's the value of education. Yeah, we part of it is you know we look back on college as the best time of your life, although you probably won't be looking back on this semester as the best time of your life. Um, generally speaking, it, it, it's something that we, um, besides all that, we, we view education as an investment in ourselves. We want to do this in order to get a good job. We want to do this in order to live a full, solid, stable life, okay? So if investments in human capital yield productivity, or an at, let me start over, if investments in economic capital yield productivity increases, the assumption here is that investments in human capital should do the same. Investments in your own skill set should also do the same. 
So human capital can be broken down into the following three types. First is what we care the most about because it's the easiest to measure, is formal education, the skills that you get through your educational experiences. The second would be firm-specific on-the-job training because anytime that you are hired at a place, there's always a little bit of how to do the job that you either need to pick up through observation or you'll be trained uh, before you actually get started. So the formal education gives you the baseline and then firm specific training gives you the actual methods that you will need to use to be successful in whatever place is um, is uh, uh, employing you. And then finally, other knowledge or vocational qualifications, just other things that aren't like reduced to a degree a degree certified uh, credential um, that that do allow you to be a more productive worker. Now. The theory has always been that this leads to a increased productivity and profits on the uh, uh, from the perspective of the firm that is employing you and increased earning in wages from the perspective of you and me. We are now able to make more money if we invest in ourselves. And this has always been the assumption underpinning the educational system. People like me who work in the educational system would like desperately to believe this students who are taking out large sums of loans in order to pay for college would also like desperately to believe this. That's the assumption. Let's take a look at how the data backs that up. If we compare annual or average weekly earnings for full-time workers, full-time wage and salary workers age 25 and older, um, there's a really clear trend that's going on on this graph here. If we look at the far left, I see for those with less than a high school diploma, that's the lowest earnings that I see here. So if we conceptualize this as a form of human capital, and if this is sounding weird to you, um, I am going to try to better theorize about where our uh, wages and, and skills ultimately come from besides human capital. Um, but for now, this is looking like support for human capital theory. I would say less than a high school diploma, low earnings, high school graduates without any college experience. That's a little bit more, right? Because now you have some type of educationally credentialed skill, um, but but it's still kind of low on the overall, uh, on the overall uh, graph here. Now, as we move to some college or associate's degree to then bachelor's degree only to then bachelor's degree and advanced degree, weekly earnings, like people's wages increase with higher levels of education. The data is very clear on that. So the more you go to school, the more degrees that you have, generally speaking, on average, you make more money. Although when you talk about advanced degrees, often the extra benefit of a PhD does not outweigh a master's degree. And that's because if you went and get a, a terminal master's degree, one of the most popular things to do with that is something like business administration, an MBA. Um, and that often leads to a very high salary where if you get a PhD, yeah, you might be getting that in nuclear engineering or you might be getting that in English literature where you have to spend the rest of your life coming up with something new to say about Shakespeare or Charles Dickens. It doesn't always translate into the highest earnings. But that being said, the unemployment rate for someone with a PhD is essentially zero. Right? There's underemployment and there's and there's below skill employment, but we really don't see almost a, a, any uh, unemployment um, at all. So anyway, here's my brilliant observation from this graph. It should have come to you already. Higher education correlates with greater earnings. Furthermore, higher education is a real guard against joblessness and unemployment except in situations where we find ourselves in a pandemic that the country was by just in no way prepared for. Uh, but I digress. So unemployment then, if we look at the lines here, the blue bar down at the bottom is the associate rate, is the uh, unemployment rate for those with an associate degree. We go up to the red line, some college or associate degree. Um, we go up to the green line, high school graduates, no college. Oh wait, I'm going, going. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, right, no, exactly, uh, green. Um, some college or an associate's uh, degree. And um, all the way up at the top, uh, I see less than a high school diploma. So this is the unemployment rate that is being um, me measured for people at different uh, levels of education. The group with the highest chance of joblessness, with the most the group that's most prone uh, to, to not having a job, it's clearly people who uh, did not finish high school. So with every single, if you want to think about this as human capital, 
at every single level of education, your chance of joblessness does decrease. So rejoice and be glad because you very likely uh, are investing in your lifelong um, uh, potential job opportunities simply by sticking around in college and simply by finishing these things out. So not only do our wages go up, but our ability to continue making those wages also uh, goes up as well. So education then clearly, if we just look at this from a pure economic standpoint, um, it's clear to me that this is a sociocultural asset. It is an asset that I can use to protect myself from uh, swings in the economy and to protect myself on the off chance. Um, that I do lose that job because I was making more money uh, throughout the life course. Even if you've never seen that data before, that's likely to be something that you already know. And it's likely to be something that parents, authority figures, guardians in your life have spent a lot of time trying to impress upon you. If that's happened to you, it probably doesn't make you unique. A lot of us have been told the same thing and a lot of us have pursued a similar path. So education is a sociocultural asset. It's something that we can use for ourselves and our own human capital. And in response, we are getting more of it. So over time, even though there's clear gender and racial splits in who finishes college, um, overall, the percentage of the population that has finished high school has been going up. The percentage of the population that has finished college has also been going up. So as of right now in the United States, about 34% of the population has a college degree. About 41% of the population has at least two years of college, which would translate to an associate's degree. So the four-year college thing, that's interesting because just about everybody that I knew when I was growing up generally went to college. And maybe they didn't all finish, but like by virtue of me going to college, it's put me into a type of social network where almost everybody I know has finished college and often beyond that because most of my friends that I maintain contact with, I've made through the education system. And so anybody I met in college usually finished and anybody that I met in grad school had by definition finished college. So, you know, we're looking at uh, a situation here where um, the population has responded to this. The population has absolutely responded um, to this need for higher education within uh, the overarching system, okay? Now that leads me to a concept I'm very interested in, the idea of credentialism. So I would ask you to think about this for a second, and you likely already have. Does finishing a high school degree mean what it meant 70 years ago? The answer is obviously it does not, right? It doesn't push you forward in a way that it used to. Does a college degree mean what it did even 30 years ago? Probably not. When we think about the decline of middle class non-college jobs, there's not much available in the middle class for people who didn't finish college anymore. There just isn't. So does a degree uh, mean what it uh, meant 30 years ago? No. Um, and it's not just your overarching emotional sense of things and, and, and the competition within the labor market. Credentialism refers to the fact that the baseline level of education for every entry level position, entry level is the key word here, is rising in accordance with the mean level of education. So at a time when only say 15% of the population had a college degree, the entry level position for many things could not be a college degree because there weren't enough college educated people to go around. But once you get to 34% of the population and among like millennials and, and Gen Z, that's going even further up uh, beyond that. Now, all of a sudden you can, if there's much more college education to go around, then certain jobs that no longer that previously didn't require a college degree can now say, yeah, all right, we're just going to hire those with a college degree. But they may not raise the wages in accordance with the education that you have received. So what you're seeing here is over time, from right around 2000, the full-time employment data for recent graduates, that's defined as like graduating college in the last, I, I believe, five years, so recent, um, that the employment uh, rate there was about 85%. That's pretty high. Now, by the time you got to 20 2014, and this starts to take a nosedive right at the end of um, 
uh, right at the end of 2008, which is when the Great Recession got underway, um, that drops down to a little above 65%. That's a massive decline in the employment chances of people like me, right? People like me who looked at the situation, looked at the economy just collapsing on itself and deciding, you know what? I always wanted to go to grad school. This was a situation where not, not only did, uh, during the recession, not only did fewer jobs open up, but more people went back to college or to grad school as a result of not having an option opportunity to be in the labor market. So we ended up with fewer jobs and a lot more people with college educations trying and competing with each other to fill those, those precious few opportunities that became available, okay? So credentialism, the core definition of credentialism here is that credentials, degrees, certified things, right? A diploma that you can hold in your hand. That becomes a form of what we think of as cultural capital that can help facilitate exchange under conditions of uncertainty. Now that sounds a little vague, so let's break down what is meant by that definition. Um, when I say uh, facilitate exchange, here's what I mean. When I applied for jobs, I wanted to be a professor and I had a PhD, right? And when I was applying for jobs, it was told to me kind of after the search was over, I have no idea who I was competing against, but the job that I ultimately got at Albion, over a hundred people applied for that job. So how do you make distinctions between people who are all very educated and likely all extremely smart, right? And, and, and all capable of doing a really good job. Well, you look at the credentials and people are doing this all the time. Part of this is an extension of the bureaucracy and the organizational society uh, topics that we covered um, back when we actually got to do this in, in, a, in, a, in a brick and mortar classroom. And one of the things I said was in large societies, in a mass society, you simply cannot treat people as individuals anymore. You just can't. It's impossible for me to get to know every single student at this college deeply and intimately. It's not possible to do that. And so as a result, we end up looking at things that can be compared to one another. And so one of the things that tends to help you if you're trying to become a professor is where you went to grad school, okay? And that's why when I was applying to grad school, I got to Ohio State through a process little more complicated than throwing a dart at the map, right? Like I applied to many, uh, I applied to a few grad schools that were um, all, all ranked in the top 25 generally because I wanted to say, okay, when I finish, I will have a top 25 PhD uh, to my name and I can use that hopefully to open up some job opportunities for me. Um, and so I went to Ohio State generally because it was the highest ranked graduate program that accepted me. Uh, and, and granted, I visited Columbus. I thought I'd be very happy there. And I was very happy there. So there were other, other things too. But the primary thing, the reason why I applied to Ohio State had nothing to do with knowledge of the state or the school itself. I simply just applied to places that seemed to fill the specialty that I wanted to study and were ranked in the top 25. And furthermore, Ohio State isn't even where I wanted to go in the first place. I wanted to go to UCLA, which was a top five institution. Um, and I didn't get in there. So, you know, I don't regret what happened, but just that's a sense of credentials, right? When I apply here, the school that's hiring me knows nothing about me, except they do see the first line on my CV, PhD from the Ohio State University. And that might carry a little bit more weight than PhD Florida State University, or especially Arizona State University. So credentialism, I just ask you, what sounds better? If I just say, I am Matthew Schoen and I am applying for a job, or Matthew Schoen, Bachelor of Arts in Sociology, Villanova University, 2009, Master of Arts, The Ohio State University, 2011, PhD, The Ohio State University, 2015. This picture here was taken at my graduation. I absolutely love that picture. It has the uh, the stained glass uh, block O in the background. So my mom took that. It's one of my favorite pictures from my graduation until I realized at a later point that there's a couple making out in the background behind me. Um, no matter, I still really like that picture. So every time I do this, if I advertise my, my degrees and where they came from, that's me participating in credentialism. And I see this happening everywhere around me. I see you guys doing it all the time. Take a look at your auto signature on the email or the ones that you get from, from your classmates sometimes. Um, people list 
all sorts of laundry lists of things, right? This is the list of your name, and this is the fraternity that you belong to, and this is your position on the volleyball team, and this is your position in almost every, you know, whatever uh, social organizations that you belong to. People list out, you know, your major, your minor, your concentration, whether or not you're on the honor roll. People list this stuff out obsessively in their email signatures, and that's participating in credentialism. I can't get to know everybody deeply and intimately, so therefore, credentials allow me to signal in this condition of uncertainty. So once you understand what this concept is, you can see it everywhere around you. Now, because college educations especially act as a credential, right? It's not so much what you studied, it's just that you went to college in the first place. The question becomes, how are people affording this? Because if you know that college is a good investment and you know that it's increasingly required for your ability to live a good life and to access certain segments of the labor market where the baseline level of uh, education for at the entry point has been increasing, how are we paying for all this? Because if you know that, so too do the colleges. So the question becomes, how are people funding their educations? And that has a very simple answer, debt. So the average student today is going to graduate with over $37,000 in debt. And many will graduate with a lot more than that, like a lot more than that. And something like 10% of the population uh, with a college degree is graduated with over $100,000 in student loans. Now, for many of us, again, nobody forced us to take those loans out. And for many of us, we don't regret taking those loans out, many people my age. Um, because education, I will never regret the fact that I got a PhD because of the job opportunities it has opened up for me. But you can have too much of this, right? If you compare the annual rate of increase of a college degree, if you compare that to the housing market and just regular inflation, college costs increase far faster than either of those two things. So if it doesn't keep up with inflation, at some point there is a shortfall and people are going to have to borrow larger and larger sums of money in order to be able to afford college, okay? And the data on student loans is troubling. Let's put it that way. It is troubling. 42, 4.2 million Americans are currently holding student loans. If you tally up the amount of exposure, exposure is just a term for how much money is owed that hasn't been paid back yet. Americans owe 1.26 trillion in exposure. A little over 11% of Americans are currently in delinquency on that, which means that they are behind on their payments. And then if you've taken statistics, this will make some sense to you. If not, just follow along. Um, the mean, the average payment in the country uh, is $351 annually, right? Just think about that being subtracted from your paycheck. It's a lot of money. Um, and the median payment is only 203. So let's break down. Let me just do statistics here for two or three minutes. If the average is 351 and the median is only 203, a median is a midpoint, right? The median uh, score or value in the distribution is the point where 50% are on, are less than that value and 50% are greater than that value. If we have a mean that is far greater than the median, in my business, we call that a positively skewed distribution. And what that often means is that there are some very severe outliers, people paying a lot more than that each month. And that's dragging the mean forward. That's dragging the mean far larger um, than what the median is. Um, so I, I think these, this, is, this is a lot of money that's outstanding. And, and I worry about this because if people owe money, but they're paying back that money, perhaps that's not such a bad thing. Like debt does help lubricate all sorts of economic transactions. It helps you buy things and access things that you never would have been able to with cash in a suitcase. So borrowing money certainly does have a place in society, but you can probably have too much. And we might already be there um, at this point anyway. All right. So while debt funds necessarily necessary expenses, 
my worry is that it can really choke an economy. So it used to be the type of debt that everybody didn't want to get into and that was really going to hold people back was credit card debt. And that's not surprising because um, the credit card debt always charges the highest interest rates. If you look at the interest rates for your student loans as compared to a credit card that you may have opened, it's not even comparable. Right? Your student loans might be between 5 and 8% depending on when you took them out, may, maybe even less than that. Um, whereas your credit card is going to charge an interest rate of 21 to 25% depending on your credit score. Um, and so... All of that money that you now have to pay back on all of these things, that's money you don't have in your pocket to save for the future and to do to buy any, any other thing that you might want to buy in a society. And if I could just talk internationally for a second here, we're the only country in the world where college costs as much here as it like as much as it as it currently does. If you look at the European higher education system, it's not that it's free. People always say this and that's completely wrong. Europeans aren't getting anything for free, but their tax burden is used to fund all sorts of social programs. So instead of having to pay for college upfront when you need it, you are essentially paying into a social system over the life course and it's there for you when it's your time to access it. So they do that with healthcare. They do that with things like rent in, in many Western European capitals. And they do that uh, certainly with the cost of college as well. Um, the more debt we have, the more that affects our ability to do the other things that we want to do uh, in, in, in our lives. So all sorts of demographic things are starting to become clear to us over 10 years after the, um, the Great Recession. People are delaying marriage greatly, right? So people, um, the age at first marriage has been creeping up for a while, um, and there are many reasons for that. But the age at first marriage, there are many millennials, people my age, that simply did not have the money saved up or the emotional stability, like the bank account that would provide them emotional stability, um, to actually buckle down and, and get married, right? Even if that might actually join people's incomes, it just feels like too stressful of a thing to pursue um, when you have all the this debt. Um, we're delaying childbirth when people aren't sure if they have the money to afford something. And I realize, and granted, to be clear, sometimes you don't decide to have children. Sometimes kids just happen. Uh, but for people who are planning to have children, uh, people are saying, oh, God, I cannot even fathom having a kid in this economy. In this market, oh my goodness, I can't, you know, if you're not secure in your job, you don't feel secure in your economy, people are a lot less likely to just pop one out. Um, people are living with their parents longer. This was actually when I was working at, when I was in school at Ohio State, I uh, spent, spent a year as a research assistant for a demographer. And uh, I helped him put together the analysis for an article he published showing that during the Great Recession, a lot more people in their mid to late 20s lived with their parents. Um, maybe that doesn't sound so bad right now, but the older you get, that is not a fun thing, right? People and, and emotionally, like it feels like you have a failure to launch in adulthood. It feels like you're just not going in the direction that, that you ultimately would want to be going. Um, and we also take fewer risks. There's fewer businesses that open and that are, are started in an economy that is so choked by debt because in order to start a new business, you almost always have to take on additional debt for that. So if I am debt free and I can look at the situation and say, you know what, I really believe in my business idea. I am going to, you know, go open a sports bar or something. And uh, I really believe in my ability to make that a success. I'll probably go and take out the small business loan. I will need to make that happen. But if I have all this debt hanging over my head, let's say I have $3,000 of credit card debt and $25,000 in student loan debt, uh, now all of a sudden that extra loan I might have to take out starts to feel way, way more serious. Um, and so it ends up, it, we lower risk taking in, in a bad way, right? Because I'm not talking about risk taking in terms of like dropping you know, acid and, and, and doing other risky things in society. No, I mean, just like taking risks that might actually really pay, pay off for you. Okay. Um, and so now if we look at the data on how this is paying off for people, yes, all that data I showed you previously about who uh, is most likely to be unemployed and who's making the most money, a college degree still seems to really help you out. But of the 41.7 million college graduates, working college graduates in 2010, this was the last census data that we had available to us, 48% of them were holding a job that actually required less than a bachelor's degree. 
Um, this is something that we call underemployment, and it's especially common for people between the ages of 22 and 30, right? People just coming out. Now, you may be able to work yourself forward, and that's becoming something that people increasingly are having to do. Um, but I can tell you, it doesn't feel great to finish college and then end up working a job that you didn't feel you needed to go to college for in the first place. But over the life course, it's very much still in your interest to go and finish that college degree. If I look at the underemployment rate by age, this is very, very interesting. People between the ages of 18 to 30, 29, 32% underemployed, that is in, an, in a job, they're employed, but they're employed in a job that requires less than whatever their highest degree obtained ultimately is. For those between the ages of 30 and 49, it's only 14%. For the boomers, uh, 50 to 64, 13.6%. For grandma and grandpa, who those are those who are still working at least, it is 12.7%. Uh, so it's us, right? It's us. It's 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 you, it's people between your age and my age that are most prone to this. Because one of the other byproducts and one of the big serious effects of the Great Recession was that if you were about to retire right before the stock market crashed, your retirement nest egg, so to speak, was completely wiped out. So people who were planning to retire all of a sudden no longer could all of a sudden wouldn't anymore. And so those people have not left the labor force and they have not opened up jobs that would have been taken by recent college graduates who all had to go back to school and get more credentials and ultimately make this whole situation worse. So it's one of those things where if we all individually pursue our own self-interest, we end up screwing the entire system because it's in the best interest of that 68-year-old to work for three more years to continue to save for retirement, that, that their retirement account that just got annihilated. Um, and it's in our best interest to go back to school, but then we all end up underemployed as a result, okay? Um, so here's the big question. Is it actually worth it to go to college? Is that something that you actually are benefiting from? Um, now, granted, there are emotional benefits to going to college. There are a lot of social benefits to going to college, but let's just talk about the numbers right here. Because when you're taking out the debt, that is the one loan that you can never get out of. Many of you might be familiar with the idea of bankruptcy. Um, yeah, bankruptcy is absolutely, a, it's, an, it's a nightmare for your credit. It, it like screws up your credit for the rest of your life. But sometimes if you just have too many assets or too many um, obligations and not enough assets, it might actually be the right thing to do in some situations. And so when you take out that college loan, when you take out that money, you uh, can actually never get out of that. It's the one student loans are immune from bankruptcy. So you will always, always, always have to pay, uh, uh, pay, pay those loans back, which I feel like they should tell you that when you take it out um, rather than just burying it in the fine print. So here's the situation. You are spending four years in college on average, some of you five years in college, but hopefully let's just go with four and you are paying for each credit. Um, but you are also on top of that, even if you make more money, you are sacrificing valuable labor force years because if you finished high school and immediately started working at age 18, that might that's going to give you four to five extra working years over the life course that allow you to, to, to make money and to advance yourself. And you do give that up if you go to college. So here are my assumptions. I want to do just some back of the napkin math right here. The average in-state tuition burden is currently 22,826. That's the average. So some people a lot more than that, some people a lot less than that, but that's kind of what it averages out to. So multiply that out by four. I want to round up to $100,000 and I want to include 50,000 in, in loans. So the overall burden here in terms of like what you had to pay up front, what you had to pay over the life course, um, the interest rates over time, let's say that comes out to 125 thousand dollars the question is how much do you have to generate in in-person earnings for your degree to actually make college worth it how can you make college pay for itself essentially well we have an answer to that about a dollar 75 over your entire working life 
you need to make a dollar seventy-five more per hour with a college degree than you would have without a college degree in order for college to essentially pay for itself and become quote unquote worth it for you. So what I'm going to do is grab the Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates of median lifetime earnings by highest educational attainment. Here you can see that for someone who has less than a high school degree, $973,000 lifetime earnings. For somebody with a professional degree, $3,648,000 uh, uh, $3, in lifetime earnings. And that's a big difference. Let's just focus on bachelor's degree versus high school degree. So let's do the math here. If you take the $1.304 million projected to be earned on average by those with a, a high school degree, I will then now divide that lifetime earning by 47. That's the number of working years someone who started working right at uh, age 18 and retired at 65 would, would be working. Um, 47 years divided by 2047, which is the number of working hours in the year, assuming a 40-hour work week, which eh, I know sometimes, maybe, maybe sometimes, maybe not other times. So what that's going to do is it's going to get you the average hourly wage over the, the life course. Somebody with a high school degree terminally will earn on average $13.50 per hour over those 47 years. What about college? Here, I am going to take the $2.268 million that's the projected estimated lifetime earnings for somebody with just a college degree and no higher. I will then divide that by 43. So I'm subtracting those four working years that you did not have because you couldn't work full time where you were in college. And then divide that again by the same 40 hour work week of a 40 hour work year uh, of, uh, of which comes out to 2047. And survey says $25.75. So that is approaching almost double in lifetime earnings, even though you subtracted the four working years off of it. So it's worth it, right? Well, I, this is where I have to walk that back. Yes. Here, my overarching um, argument is that college is both criminally overpriced and yet still absolutely worth it for you. Keep in mind, I did make some assumptions here. I made a lot of assumptions when I did this, actually. For starters, I assumed a level of student debt where you took out $50,000 in loans. Some people are taking out in the realm of one hundred dollars to $200,000, depending on what their credit background is and depending on how long they need to go to school for. So if that is more... You spend a lot more time paying it back and you make higher monthly payments, which is going to hurt your ability to advance yourself and is going to hurt your degree's ability to pay for itself. I also assumed a 40-hour work week, which people consistently are not working 40 hours a week. We're either working a lot more than that or a lot less than that. Um, even in my industry, like the, there are, I have, I have weeks where sometimes I'm working, it feels like I'm working 70 to 80 hours throughout the week. I have some weeks where the only time I'm working is when I happen to be in front of students. You tally it up and at the end of the year, it ends up being probably about a 50 hour work week uh, on average. But that's before you factor in my summers, which uh, are absolutely not 40 hour, or four, or even not, absolutely not even a 40 hour work week. So making that assumption uh, is, is yeah, I, in theory, I would have to make more money if I'm working more hours in order for that to, to pay for itself and to maintain that $25 and 75 cents um, limit. I'm also assuming a 40-hour work, uh, work week for people in the high school uh, degree area. And ever since we went to um, the Affordable Care Act, which for God even knows what state that is in right now, um, but, but at that time, the, any, anybody uh, who was working 30 hours or more for a company was considered full time and needed to be put on the uh, and 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 the company had an obligation to offer those people uh, health care insurance uh, uh, health insurance through the group policy. However, uh, because most American corporations um, would would rather uh, not see their workers as human beings, uh, 
they ended up putting a lot of people on part time and only up to 29 hours a week. So the 40 hour work week sounds great. It's it's a holdover from the union days. Like it's just not really what people are doing anymore. Um, in terms of labor force opportunities, um, how do you quantify being underqualified or overqualified? If you're doing something you're way under or overqualified to do, um, that is going to matter for like life and job satisfaction. And then finally, perhaps the biggest assumption I made, and this is one I really want you to think think at length about, I'm making the assumption that life is an economic equation that like, hey, if your college degree paid for itself, it was worth it for you. And if it didn't pay for itself, it wasn't worth it for you. Life is not an economic equation, right? For example, I sacrificed, like I, uh, after college, like after grad school, I didn't finish my PhD until I was 28 years old. And so that meant I gave up almost all of the peak working years in my 20s in order to get that doctoral degree. But I in no way regret it. And not just because it's not to say like I'm not making millions of dollars off my PhD right now, not in the slightest, but I feel extremely satisfied with my job. I feel extremely satisfied with the job that I have, right? I mean, I get, I have, I have a, an outrageous amount of freedom. I teach what I want to teach. I uh, research what I want to research. I get four months off in the summer, right? I get to travel uh, to some of our international partners. Um, there is no situation where I feel that college didn't pay off for me, no matter what it costed. And I know many other people don't share that, but many people do share that uh, opinion as well. Um, so, you know, our generation in a way that our parents may be different, like we're, we're starting to look at a job, not just as a way to fund the rest of our life. We're starting to look at jobs as almost an extension of who we are. And we want it to be personally fulfilling. We want it to be emotionally satisfying. And that is not something that I think that millennials and Gen Z should be apologizing for. Okay. Um, so education, uh, if you were on the fence about whether or not college was, was a good investment for you, it is. And if you were on the fence about whether it's a good emotional and social investment for you, well, that's up to you to make that work for yourself. Okay. So anyway, that concludes my discussion of education. It is uh, an institution that people are often extremely stressed out by and people often don't think of in what, what I would conceptualize as the right way. But like it or not, education is going to always exist. And that is a good thing, right? I said like it or not. And that, that was kind of just like a throwaway, but it is something that, that must continue um, to exist. Now, next week, we're going to talk about another institution that everybody is prone to and everybody lives under. That that is the institution of politics. Um, we all live in some type of a political system, and that is uh, where um, we're going to spend some time. So no lecture video on Friday, but you must submit your, lec your uh, assignment to by 9.15 that morning. I am ready to help you if you need it, and I am ready to uh, uh, answer any questions that you may have. Thanks very much for listening. See you next time.